thanks for coming. Uh, can I get my slides? Yeah. So KubeOS is uh, the project we've been working on for some time. It's a reasonably secure desktop OS. It's supposed to be a reasonably, reasonably secure desktop OS. And it implements security by compartmentalization approach. Um, it's important to realize that Cubes is not really a hypervisor. It just is a user of a hypervisor, or VMM, which currently happens to be Zen. It's also not a Linux distro. If you really want to call it a distro, it's a Zen distro in that case. So why we do it? We do it because we really need secure client systems. And when I say client, I mean phone, desktop, tablet, laptop. I'll be using desktop in this presentation. Desktop client all means uh, the same to me. So we really need secure client systems. It's because client systems are really our eyes, ears, and fingertips. Because if our client system is compromised, then really there is no security. However secure your cloud, your crypto, your network protocols might be, <clears throat> if your client system is compromised, it's just the game over. Because the client system and the malware that is there can see your screen, can simulate your keyboard, so your actions, etc. So we really need secure client systems. And the problem we have is that uh, present client systems are not really secure, are totally insecure, actually. Some problems that we have today and uh, those problems are not going away. Attacks coming through otherwise decent applications, uh, such as web browsers or PDF readers, through an exploit. So we open a malicious PDF that exploits some buffer overflow in PDF reader, or Microsoft Office, or LibreOffice, or whatever, and you get owned. Attacks coming through malicious applications that we just accidentally installed, some spyware, backdoors, whatever. Attacks coming through USB devices, which might be untrusted because they might be having a, a file system with malformed metadata or maybe malformed partition table, which just happens to be exploiting some hypothetical back in kernel uh, file system module. Or maybe they have a malicious firmware even, as some, some recent uh, proof of concept shown, shown uh, this year. Attacks coming through networking stacks, so all the Wi-Fi drivers and stacks. DHCP client, like a few weeks ago, Bashokalypse, DHCP, DHCP client exploit. Probably many of you were uh, worrying about this problem. It's not like the problem suddenly appeared just two weeks ago. It's been here for years, and it is here to stay. Attacks coming to, uh, oh, that I just said, file system, metadata, volume metadata. Lack of GUI isolation, whether it's Linux, Xorg, whether it's Mac OS X, whether it's Windows, there's essentially no GUI isolation. So if I have a stupid Tetris game running alongside my email client where I, which I use for my sensitive encrypted email, the stupid Tetris application can just request to see the screenshot of the content of my email client window. This is just wrong. So these are some fundamental problems that we see on desktop systems and uh, <coughs> there is really no good protection against those. Probably it should be obvious to you that um, patching or f trying to find all the bugs in kernel, all the file systems, all the drivers, etc., or the applications <laughs> is just not feasible. It's also important to realize that security challenges with the 
related with desktop systems are quite different from those uh, on servers. Uh, it's my impression that lots of people doing security, especially on Linux, they still have this kind of server-oriented thinking. And one important problem is that monolithic systems are generally hard to secure, especially desktop systems. Monolithic kernel is bad for security, because when we think about it, why all these things, why Wi-Fi drivers stacks, Bluetooth drivers stacks, USB, USB drivers stacks, all the various exotic APIs and subsystems, why all these things should be part of the TCB? I mean, why? <laughs> I really come from a different background. I'm, I'm coming from security, not from open source background. So when I look at this, of course, it's not Linux specific. The same Windows, the same OS X. It's a myth that OS X is a microkernel. From security point of view, it is not. So that's pretty concerning. So monolithic is not only about the kernel, it's also about the rest of the system. So I, I use the term monolithic system. GUI server. <coughs> Again, another monolithic creation, XORG, with its X protocol and its whole code base that it's, I can bet, full of exploitable bugs. And you don't really need a bug, because as just previously said, there is no effective GUI isolation, so it's perfectly legal for an application to request a screenshot of other applications. Various other systems, services, especially on a desktop system. And by the way, it is irrelevant whether, for example, our X server is rootless. Because whether it's part of the system TCB or not is not so relevant when we, do, when we consider a user data point of view. The XORC might be running not as root, still has access to all the application window contents. So monolithic for me, from the security point of view, means bloated, complex, difficult to understand, and manage. Manage, so to decide which parts of the system can communicate with which ones and which should not, because some of them are trusted, so some of them are not. Okay, so how do we, how do we solve those, those problems? Security by compartmentalization, as I just mentioned. That's an obligatory uh, Cubes architecture slide. So we have a some thin hypervisor, which actually happens to be Zen. We have uh, app VMs where user applications and, and data are, and we have some system uh, service domains, for example, for net, networking stacks and USB stacks. So it's net VM, USB VM. And we have secure admin and GUI domain. So there is, um, so yes, we, we use virtualization to isolate domains. That's a very good question to ask, why would virtualization, why would VMs be any better isolated from each other than normal processes? Is there something wrong with, with good old um, uh, memory management unit? with ring 3, ring 0 separation? Have you ever heard about an exploit that would be exploiting ring, uh, ring 3 to ring 0 uh, escalation on Intel processors? I have not. And obviously, if we think about those, then we can have a... Uh, we can conclude that perhaps a virtualization is not the best thing to do because just adding another layer of, layer of complexity does not, is not going to solve any problem, right? However, virtualization offers two important properties. First of all, it allows to reduce the interfaces. 
especially the VM hypervisor, the VM TCB interface. So instead of implementing all the exotic APIs, instead of exposing all those drivers, all those, having all those file system modules, and God knows what else, in the, in the TCB, we don't have them. The hypervisor does, does do CPU, uh, memory, device, maybe virtualization, and a few other things. That's like almost nothing. At the same time, virtualization allows us to preserve legacy, uh, compatibility with legacy apps and drivers. And that's extremely important because if we are going to change the system API, nobody is going to use our system. So th these are two key, key properties of, of why we use virtualization. <clears throat> but before we get too excited about how great virtualization is, it's important to realize, realize that the VM hypervisor interface that we are shrinking or reducing, it is not the only interface of concern. So here is a simple example. <clears throat> Let's say we have two VMs and they are so well separated using hardware and forced virtualization, right? Very strong isolation, very thin hypervisor. Zen, or maybe some microkernel or separation kernel, whatever. Now imagine that we are adding some inter VM service. Oh, well, because perhaps somebody wanted to do file sharing and added SMB uh, server there. Or maybe it's a graphics virtualization. Maybe this this thing, the, the rectangle complex input processing code, maybe this is the GPU backend. Or maybe that's even storage backend that is just smart and does all kinds of copy and write and other optimizations. Whatever. That's a typical picture on many virtualization systems. We add some complex backend or code and expose it through a complex protocol to other VMs. So now if it happens to be that there is some malware on the um, orange VM, it might just exploit some hypothetical software bug, like buffer overflow in this complex input processing code, totally regardless of whether this is running under Zen, uh, microkernel, whatever. And of course, this means that the separation is no longer so strong, it's pretty weak. So the lesson from this is that we should not get too excited about hardware virtualization. Because again, virtualization is really nothing magic when it comes to security. Besides that it reduces interfaces and preserves compatibility. Except for IMMU, which I discussed later. And where we should really be careful about it, what we should really be careful about are the inter-VM interfaces. And the code that handles inter-VM services or communication. Here are some questions you might ask to your virtualization solution vendor. How do they do device simulation? What is QMU? Is it part of the TCB? How is networking, storage virtualization done? Are, are the backends part of the TCB or not part of the TCB? They should not be. USB virtualization, the same. GUI virtualization. Well, if you see a GPU or especially OpenGL or DirectX being exposed to untrusted VMs, chances are high that, that, that this totally negates today, negates the isolation. Generally, how is the inter-VM communication framework done? How is, for example, file copy done between VMs? Does it require running uh, uh, NFS or SMB between two VMs, or is it done smarter? So I just said the virtualization is nothing special, it's just practical. <coughs> However, there is one, one important technology that I should mention 
that has been not really virtualization per se, but has been introduced together with virtualization extensions on, on, on Intel and AMD. And that is, of course, IOMMU, which on Intel is called VTD. It is important not to confuse VTD with VTX. VTX is just CPU virtualization. <coughs> So it allows for truly the privileged driver domains, and Zen was probably pioneer in, probably still is, in, in using uh, driver domains, using IMMU. Allows us to have NetVMs and USB VMs. And by the way, there's been a debate about microkernels some years ago, whether microkernels or monolithic kernels. Microkernels without IOMU makes no sense from the security point of view, because without IOMMU, you cannot have truly untrusted driver domains or processes. So NetVM, uh, that's what we have in cubes by default. You put all your um, Wi-Fi and other stacks in, a, in a priv the privileged networking domain. And this makes you feel good when you use Wi-Fi at airport or in the hotel or at a conference because you don't have to worry about all the potential attacks there. DHCP client, for example, a recent attack. Similarly, we can have USB VM in cubes. It's just a few clicks and you can have it. If bad USB makes you feel uneasy, that's a nice solution. So the picture just shows that uh, we have some extremes. We have a monolithic system on the left where everything essentially runs at the same, priv at the same privilege. Again, I'm talking about monolithic system, not just the kernel. On the right extreme, we see uh, powered down air gaps, a totally useless uh, uh, thought experiment, right? Just turned off machines, but they are very secure. And somewhere in the middle, we try to position cubes. We try to find a good balance between uh, security and usability. And cubes really offers lots of flexibility in, in it allows to give a slide, to treat it as a slider somehow and just move it from one extreme to the other. So uh, quickly about the status, release one, 2010, 2012, release two, uh, just released last month, release three is coming, um, release two implements everything we just talked about. You can go to kubesos.org and, and, and read lots of docs and, and go to mailing list and, and download the ISO. We use Fedora 20 as a primary template. And, uh, we also have Debian and Arch Linux templates for those of you who, who don't like Fedora. Uh, our DOM0 is currently based on Fedora 20, but it should really be irrelevant to you because there, is, there are really no user apps or data in DOM0. DOM0, in our case, is just a dump thin terminal. We also have support for Windows 7 based VMs. Um, but of course, you must install Windows and provide licensing key. So it's a, um, besides just being a collection of VMs, where really Cube's strength can show off is in um, when you write an application specifically for Cube's. For example, we have a pretty nicely uh, integrated Tor VM. Uh, since 2012, and right now there is another work going on by the Hunix people who are porting Hunix to Cubes OS. It's very nice because uh, you can you can get some advantages of isolation, and at the same about at the same time, uh, from our very simple and we think very secure inter VM communication framework. Same securing email is also another example. For example, we have attachments that allows you, uh, uh, plugins that allows you to open attachments in disposable VMs, 
Um, we can we have a little plugin uh, application for split GPG where you can put your private keys in an offline VM, etc. Our t release three is what is coming soon. We already started working on it last year. The primary new feature there is the, the introduction of hy hypervisor abstraction layer, which will allow you to easily uh, switch Xen for KVM, Linux containers perhaps even, if you really want that, for performance, or perhaps Microsoft Hyper-V even. Perhaps we're going to do some commercial spin-offs. Uh, or perhaps some academic exotic microkernel for elimination of or redu reduction of cooperative cover channels or, or side channels. We also have reworked architecture. So, there's the website, there's the uh, master key fingerprint, there's this video, vid video type, so it's an evidence that's the fingerprint. And also, if you're interested, we have a session at uh, this afternoon, two hour introduction to cubes where we show various practical things live and how to set up different things and also intro for developers for cubes. Okay, thank you very much.